Hi, I'm Professor Scott Sampson from Brigham Young University. And today I'm going to talk with you about service businesses and the inevitable decline of interaction. When we think of service businesses, we think of businesses that involve some type of interaction. We think about interacting maybe with a bank teller, maybe interacting with a salesperson at a retail location, maybe interacting with a server at a restaurant. Now this is different from other types of business operations that are not interactive. For example, auto manufacturing. There, the manufacturing process takes place independent from the customer, well before the customer is ever involved in this process. In fact, the customer's involvement in driving the car can take place completely uh, separated and segmented from the production of the automobile itself. This is a non-interactive process versus an interactive process. Now, if we look at any process, we can actually see different ways in which the process can be manifest. So let's take driving a car, for example. So if you have a transportation need, one alternative you have is to drive your own car. Another alternative, maybe if you're in a distant city, you might rent a car, drive somebody else's car. Another alternative would be perhaps to take a taxi. So somebody is driving a car, taking you to the destination you need to go to. So this type of an alternative here, we typically think of as being a full service option. Full service meaning they're doing everything for you. This option here we often think of as being a self-service option. Self-service meaning that you are serving using the resources that they provide to you, in this case the automobile. And then this option over here we often think of as a DIY or do-it-yourself option, meaning use your own resources, use your own control of these resources to meet your need. Now this uh, kind of spectrum between full service, self service and do it yourself actually exists in a lot of different businesses and a lot of different industries. For example, in food service, we can have a full service option, which is going to a restaurant where a server takes your order, delivers the food and so forth. We could have a self service option where the customers use the restaurant's facilities and serve themselves or we could have a do it yourself option, which could be just cooking your own food in your own kitchen. Another example could be fitness, sport, uh, fitness options. So for example, if we want to have a fitness training program, a full service option could be something like a personal trainer. Somebody that meets with you, studies your needs, and helps develop a fitness program tailored uniquely to you. A self service option might be to just go to a gym and use their facilities, use instructions that might be posted there, but it's largely self service. And then of course a do it yourself option would be just to buy a DVD and just stay at home and do your own fitness program at home. So as we look at this spectrum of the different types of options, the full service traditionally has been held up as kind of the epitome of service. It's kind of what uh, companies would aspire to. Uh, examples of this might be the Ritz-Carlton in hotels. Or in retail, an example would be Nordstrom. In uh, air transportation, it could be like uh, Singapore Airlines that's known, again, for the full service offerings, where they really do a lot for you, have highly trained employees. Let's talk about retail for a little bit here. So Nordstrom has this model of self-service where they have a lot of interaction in the process. In fact, this model of self-service, or not, not self-service, but full service, is really not new. In fact, if we go back 100 or 200 years ago, we find that most retail would have been self, or full service, where the employee meets with the customer, the customer presents a list of uh, goods or uh, items that they need, the employee would then go back in the stock room and collect all those items and put together the bundle of goods and give it to the customer. So again, this full service has been really, uh, up until not too long ago, really the tradition of retail. Now that actually changed in October of 1917. In that year, in that month, actually, this man, Clarence Saunders, uh, was granted a U.S. patent. And this was his patent. It was U.S. patent number 1,242,872. And here's one excerpt from that patent. He said, the object of my said invention is to provide a store equipment by which the customer will be enabled to serve himself. Clarence Saunders actually invented self-serve retail. Again, up to that point, it was a very interactive process, a full-service offering. Uh, the company that he founded based on this patent is called Piggly Wiggly, and it still exists today. And so Piggly Wiggly, it was very innovative. Now, of course, today we think of self-service retail as being standard. It's a very common offering. But in this day, it was very unusual. In fact, there were a lot of skeptics, I think, that were saying, oh, I don't think this is going to work. Well, some of the aspects of this that Clarence was involved in, this uh, development of the Piggly Wiggly self-service option, one of them is this idea that you have an entrance door where the customers go in, and then an exit where they come out, and then they have to pay before they leave. It's, it's, again, it seems quite common today, but it was very innovative in uh, 1917. Another invention is the idea of putting tags on items so that the customer can actually tell how much items uh, cost without having to talk to a person. Another invention, this man, Mr. Goldman, was one of... Uh, 
uh, Clarence's employees, he actually invented the shopping cart. And they had different models of this, and they finally developed the shopping cart that really helped the customers to be able to meet their own uh, shopping needs. Now, unfortunately, Clarence, because of some uh, uh, financial dealings, he actually was ousted out of the company. But a number of years later, actually in February of 1937, Clarence started his uh, second uh, retail venture. The name of this company was Caduzel. And the word Caduzel means the key does it all. And so it involved this thing that he called the key was a device that had this paper tape in it. And the way it worked is a customer would go into the store and get one of these keys and find the items they would want behind these little glass display cases. And then they'd stick the key in this little receptacle and then push the button corresponding to the item. It would record the item on the tape and simultaneously it would trigger a conveyor belt behind the store and the item would go down a little on a chute onto a conveyor belt and the items would be gathered together and when the customer got to the checkout they stick their key into the cashier receptacle the machine would read the tape tally up the bill the person would get their bundles of good and leave so it's almost like the store was a vending machine again very innovative it didn't uh, catch on it had some technological problems i think it really was ahead of its time but again emphasizing this idea that self-service is really potentially a future of retail now, if we look at self-service retail today, we see that really it's the standard for most businesses. If we think of all the big retailers, companies like Target, Walmart, and Costco, they all follow this model of self-serve retail. What about Nordstrom? You know, Nordstrom still has this idea of full service and highly interactive processes. Well, in fact, Nordstrom as a company has actually had to shutter a lot of their retail stores, their Nordstrom flagship stores. But the company continues to grow. And the reason it continues to grow is because Nordstrom is opening this thing that they call Nordstrom Rack which is really a self-serve model where you walk into the store, you browse the items, there's not a lot of employees there to help you and you take your items and check out as you leave. So even Nordstrom is some, succumbing to this pressure to move to a self-service model. In fact, in my research, we've actually seen that there's just a lot of different industries that are affected by the same phenomenon of shifting from a full-service offering to self-service offerings. Uh, one example is banking. It hasn't been that many years ago, maybe 25 years ago or so, where a lot of banking took place through meeting with tellers and interacting person to person. And of course, these days, most banking takes place either with automatic teller machines or phone banking, which is really common now. Uh, stockbrokers, again, if we go back 25 years ago, we found out a lot of the stockbroker business, companies like Smith Barney and Merrill Lynch, they were very interactive. You'd meet with the stockbroker and discuss options for investments. Uh, these companies, of course, Merrill Lynch about went bankrupt in 2007, and Smith Barney had to lay off about 3,500 of their brokers since the start of this uh, century. And uh, why? Well, they've been replaced with online brokers, E-Trade, Scott Trade, and companies like that. Of course, we know travel agents. Uh, in the olden days, travel agents were something you met with a travel agent, a lot of interaction. And again, these days, we're usually using online travel agents, such as Travelocity or Orbitz and so forth. Uh, airlines are having the same type of effect here. Again, we still have some of this where you actually go and talk to people to check in at the counter at the airline, but more and more we're seeing this type of thing, where we have self-check-in, where you scan your passport and get all the information. In fact, Air France, I was in Marseille, France not too long ago, and when I did the self-check-in here, it actually printed out my bag tags and had instructions about how I could attach them to my bags, throw the bags onto the belt. I didn't have to interact with anybody to even check my own bags. And again, we're seeing this trend in uh, a lot of airlines as well as a lot of other industries. I think one interesting example of this is the European airline Ryanair. Ryanair, actually, they're known as a low fare air carrier. Uh, I flew, not, again, not too many years ago, from Marseille, France to Porto, Portugal. For, I actually flew for 7 euro, but I checked just a few months ago and the price was 19 euro, which is pretty cheap for a flight of that distance. Well, in fact, what Ryanair does is charges you for other things. For example, this is from their website. If you book online, there's no surcharge, but if you book at the airport, it's 20 euro surcharge. If you need to order oxygen and reserve that, there's no charge if you do it online, but if you have to do it at the airport, it's 50 euro. Uh, if, you have, if you don't have your boarding card at the airport, if you forget your boarding card that you printed out at home, they'll charge you 15 euro to print it out again. Uh, if you want to check in at the airport and actually talk to a person, you're going to have to pay 45 euro to talk to a person. I consider this kind of the high price of interaction that they're representing here. And Ryan has been effective at using this to motivate their customers to do a lot of things themselves, and thus lowering their cost structure, making them a very profitable airline. This concept that we're talking about here today is what I call deservitization. It's the removing of some service elements or some elements of interaction from a service. 
Uh, here's kind of how deservitization happens, is we have interactive businesses where a skilled provider meets with a customer to help meet the customer needs. And what we find is that sometimes the providers get together, or some entrepreneurs, and they start thinking about this. And they think, you know, I'll bet there's some way that we can somewhat standardize this particular offering and maybe develop some type of a technology that we can put in the customer's hand to let them meet their own needs. Well, when this happens, we find out that the need for the interaction decreases because now the customers are able to meet their needs without having costly interactions here. These uh, customers, or the uh, customers obviously win because of this. They have, you know, uh, uh, have their needs met at a lower cost. The providers, the ones that develop the technology, of course, they, have be they benefit from this because they have uh, greater reach and greater economies of scale in uh, whatever their offering is. The one that really suffers is the interactive provider, the skilled frontline employee that's actually interacting with the customers because, again, there's a reduced need for them. This effect of displacing employees is, again, becoming a very common pattern we're seeing in a lot of industries. This was actually repeated, a repeat of what we saw back in the 70s and 80s where manufacturing prior to that was very labor intensive, but we saw a big infusion of technology that displaced a lot of workers. Similarly today in the service sector, we're seeing that many service jobs are being replaced by technologies. You know, McDonald's now, of course, has the kiosk that you can order, which eliminates the need for uh, having as many employees in the restaurant. Uh, this is some data from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2014. Uh, there were 4.6 million salespeople in 2014, which could potentially be re replaced by technologies such as Amazon. Uh, 3.4 million cashiers, again, replaced by self-checkout technologies. Uh, 3.1 million fast food workers that could be replaced by kiosks. Uh, we have 2.5 million call center workers that potentially could be replaced by this automated voice recognition Siri types of technologies. 2.4 million waiter, waitress uh, people that again could be replaced by some form of robotics. So my question is, who's next? Who's next in the line to be displaced by technology and these self-serve technologies? Well, uh, one example might be healthcare. And uh, in healthcare, which is traditionally a very labor-intensive process, we have things such as immunizations. And even today, this is becoming available this very year, the ability to actually buy a kit and do your own self-immunizations without having to interact with any healthcare professional. What about education, my business here? You know, we look at the tradition of education and it's very interactive, like we are here today. We're in a classroom, we're meeting, we're interacting, we have great professors like here's the great Clayton Christensen from the Harvard Business School. Now we can compare that to a self-service technology such as online education. One example of that is the University of Phoenix, which is really big in online education. Now I know people argue, they say, well this isn't the same. You don't get the same education from online education as you do from these brick and mortar types of universities. Well I wonder if that's true or not. In fact, Clayton Christensen himself actually took up an offer to go provide a course on the University of Phoenix. So students at the University of Phoenix can actually take a course from Clayton Christensen remotely, something they would never be able to do if they weren't admitted to the Harvard Business School previously. So even Clayton Christensen, I think, is recognizing the fact of these deservitizing technologies are uh, really inevitable. So how do we stay relevant? If we're in a business, an interactive business, it could be accounting, it could be education, it could be consulting, it could be healthcare or whatever, how do we stay relevant in our jobs? Well, I just have a few ideas to share about that. One is, is we have to make the interactions relevant. The interactions that we do have have to be things that cannot be easily replaced by technology. So in my business, for example, in education, uh, again, the tradition is the classrooms, we try to be efficient, we have these big lecture classrooms and we teach all the principles and things like that and the students take notes. Then the students go home and they do their homework on their own. Well, in fact, researchers have discovered that this model is actually kind of backwards for education. Because if you think about it, if you're in a large lecture classroom, especially up, uh, if you're up on row number 27 or something like that, there's not a lot of meaningful interaction going on there. So the substitute for that would be something like this, where you have, again, uh, video recorded lectures that you would then study on your own. Now the question is, what do you do when you get to class? Well, let's make this meaningful interaction. We have these things, they call it the flip classroom, 
where when you get to class, you actually work on your homework in class. You have discussion groups, you have meetings, you discuss with the professor, and you do things that are, again, meaningful interactions. So that's one of the things I'd recommend is any interactions we have in our businesses need to be meaningful. And if they're not, maybe we ought to think about how we could deservitize ourselves, or in other words, enable the customers to meet their own needs without interacting. An example of that that I can think of is from healthcare. You know, healthcare, one of the challenges it faces is because of the interaction, it can be very inconvenient to receive even relatively minor care. But recently, we've seen technologies like this become available where you can skip the waiting room and on your phone, you can actually meet with a doctor, discuss your symptoms, potentially even get some diagnosis and recommendations coming out of that. Uh, the last example I'd like to finish with today, and I don't know if this is, you know, uh, realistic or not, but the idea of death. Are there limits to deservitization? Are there limits to customers meeting their own needs without interacting? Well, here's uh, an example. This is from actually a local funeral home here, the Nelson Family Mortuary. They have funeral webcasting, real-time webcasting of every funeral. I don't know if this is, you know, realistic, if this is going to catch on or not. I mean, if the day comes where we just sit in the comfort of our own homes instead of actually having to go to funerals. The thing I do know for sure is we are soon to see the death of interaction as we know it, and so we better prepare for that. Thank you very much.